Namo namaha and welcome back. So now that we've learned the kind of basics of vowel sandhi, which is of course when the first word ends in a vowel v1, uh, now let's turn to consonant sandhi, which is going to uh, which is going to take place when the first word ends with a consonant c1. There are little twists here and there when it comes to consonant sandhi, uh, but the, for the most part I think that you'll find that the vast majority of consonant sandhi is relatively straightforward, um, kind of easy to spot in the wild, maybe, uh, maybe even a little bit easier than some of our tricky vowel sandhis that we were looking through. Um, there's going to be four general situations in consonant sandhi. Uh, first, we can look at what happens when a consonant is in the absolute final position at the end of a sentence. Uh, the second thing is what we'll look at when a word ending in a consonant C1 uh, is followed by a word that starts with a vowel C2, uh, V2. Then we'll look at a number of what I'm calling C1, C2 situations, where a word ends in a consonant C1, and then it's followed by a word that starts with another consonant C2. So first, let's talk about those situations when a word that ends in a consonant happens to be the last word of a sentence. Uh, there's five different cases that we need to worry about. Uh, first, all word final nasals, when they're at the end of a sentence, remain unchanged. You leave them, you put a virama on, underneath, uh, and you're done. Like, let's say the word ended, uh, the sentence ended in the word karman, pustakam. These are going to stay exactly as they are. Uh, second, when you have non-palatal stops, that means members of the kavarga, the tavarga, the tavarga, and the pavarga. Uh, aside from the nasals, because we already dealt with those, right? Um, the, these vargas, these classes, are all going to reduce to their unvoiced, unaspirated sort of lead member of the class. So if we had a word like anushtub, which ends with a bhakara, and it's the name of a poetic meter, that bhakara, uh, if it comes at the end of the word, the end of the sentence, uh, it's going to lose the aspiration and also the voicing, and it's going to reduce down to your bhakara, your sort of lead uh, consonant of the class, leaving us with anushtup. Uh, if we have the word suhrud, which means friend, that dakara, that dental voiced dental, is going to lose that voicing and become the dental dakara, turning it into suhrut. Uh, if the sentence final word ends in a palatal stop now, that one we skipped, something interesting happens. The palatal varga, the cha varga, I call them unstable. Uh, they're kind of like radioactive particles. They either are going to jump up to the ka varga, the velars, or they're sometimes going to jump down to the retroflexes. It's kind of unpredictable, uh, these, um, these uh, letters. You just have to learn which word, which letters, which words go in which direction. But in all cases, the words will also lose uh, the voicing and aspiration of that final consonant. So you're going to have the word watch, which means speech. Uh, it, if it comes at the end of the sentence, that chakara at the end is going to jump up to the velar class and become a kara. And you'll end up with walk, speech. If in the word viraj, though, which means the kind of primal creation, the word the fin the word final jakara is not going to jump up, but it's going to jump down to the retroflex classes. It's going to lose its voicing, and it's going to become a tagara, and the, so the word turns into virat when it's at the end of a sentence. I know the cricketer. Uh, the palatal shakara, which is also going to behave this way when it comes at the end of a sentence, that word final sh this, this uh, palatal sibilant uh, is going to jump up to the velar class, the kavarga, and it's actually going to turn into a kara, which means the, the word dish becomes dik, uh, meaning direction, when it, uh, it's at the end of the sentence. Those are the paddle, palatal stops. Let's look at a wor what happens when the uh, word ends in the dental sibilant s or a retroflex semivowel r. In both cases, when s or r are at the end of a sentence, it's going to turn into a visarga. This is actually an important feature to keep in mind right now when we uh, 
when you see a visarga, think of it as representing usually an S and sometimes an R. Fix that kind of subconsciously in your mind right now. It's going to become valuable when we start doing uh, visarga sandhi in our next segment. So if we had the word tapas, which means uh, ascetic practice, not Spanish snacks, uh, this, if, it, if this comes at the end of a sentence, it becomes tapaha. Uh, namas, meaning bow, becomes namaha. We've had that, right? Namo namaha, right? Uh, for our ending words, words that end in the ra kara, some examples could be pitar, meaning father. This is going to become pitaha. Matar, mother, becomes mataha. Punar, again, is going to become punaha. Uh, finally, we can look at when there's a consonant cluster that uh, finds itself in that word final position, absolute final position. Here the situation is kind of simple. Generally speaking, you're not allowed to have a consonant cluster that ends a sentence or a word. Uh, the cluster gets reduced then to just the first uh, letter in the conjunct. So the word bhavant, which would mean being, becomes bhavan. Uh, gachant, going, would become gachan. Uh, actually, this rule gets mostly applied in internal sandhi, uh, and, uh, and, it, and it pops up when we start to conjugate verbs. But it's good to learn that now uh, that when consonant clusters come at the end of a sentence, they're going to get downgraded to just the first consonant in the cluster. Okay, now with those out of the way, let's turn to what happens when a word ending in a consonant, C1, uh, runs into a word that starts with a vowel, V2. It's a very fairly easy Sunday situation because that word final consonant first is going to get voiced and then the vowel gets attached to that now voiced consonant as a matra. So if we had tat eva, uh, meaning just like that, then the word final the kara would have to gain voicing. It turns into a voiced dental, the d kara. Then the a gets written as a matra on top of your d kara, and you end up with tad eva. Uh, if we had the word samyak asti, it's all well. Uh, the word the word final k kara of samyak is now going to gain voicing and turn into a g kara. Uh, the voiced velar, and it's going to swallow up that uh since the gakara already has that uh built in. So we end up with samyagasti. It gets all written together as one word. It looks like one word. It's two words smashed together. Now we can turn to the most intricate situation for consonant sandhi. It'll take some time to get through it. Uh, when the, a word ends in a consonant C1 and it follows by it's followed by another word that starts with a second consonant C2. C1, C2 situation. Uh, here we can start with a general rule that C1 is going to assimilate within its own class to the same voicing or nasalization that C2 has. So if we had wak followed by bhata, we would get wag bhata. Uh, the ka becomes a ga. This is the name of a famous scholar. Uh, here the ka turns voiced uh, and it matches the voicing of your ba of bhata. Uh, note, however, that it doesn't gain that aspiration of the ba. We don't get wag bata. We just get wag bata. The same way if wak is followed by maya, we would get vang maya, uh, which means literature. Actually. The kagara jumps to match the nasal status of the makara by becoming the corresponding velar nasal. Vang maya. That's the general rule. Now, the dentals and nasals don't follow our general rule, uh, and these are actually more common, so listen up. This will be on the test, uh, basically. Uh, so, if you have a word final dental, the kara, that comes in that C1 position, and then if C2 is either a palatal retroflex or dental stop, meaning not the top row, the kavarga, or the bottom row, the pavarga, then what's going to happen is that the kara in your C1 position assimilates to the same class as the C2 consonant and then gains voicing if it needs to gain voicing in order to assimilate. So uh, it can get voiced, but it won't get aspiration again. Uh, if you have bhavat that comes before janma, your takara in bhavat is going to turn into a jakara and it's going to become bhavat janma, meaning your birth. 
If we had the word etat before dhanam, the tkara would stay in the dental class. The the is incidental, but it's going to get voiced to match the voicing of the tkara, and it would stay unaspirated, and we end up with the tkara etat dhanam. This money. The rule applies again to all the vargas except the velars and the labials, the top and bottom row. Those are going to be separate cases. In those cases, the tkara follows our first general rule. So it's either going to stay t or jump to d if that c2 is voiced. Uh, we can have etat karma, this action, this act, or etad basma, this ash. Uh, uh, the, in this case, the first tkara stays unchanged. The second one is jumped to become the d, the voiced dental because of the influence of that voicing of the bhagara in basma. One very strange situation is when the word final tkara in that c1 position. Uh, you just have to learn the, this rule. When it comes before a word that starts with the palatal sibilant sh, uh, in this situation, the whole cluster somehow turns into ch, uh, the palatal chakara plus chakara cluster. Uh, if we have etat followed by shariram, meaning this body, this turns into etat shariram. What can I say? It's a totally strange and unexpected thing. It goes to prove that Sunday rules. Uh, and I can guarantee that the first time you find this in the wild, this acha Sunday, you're going to have no idea that it's actually takara followed by shakara. It'll stump you. You'll get frustrated. Second time you see it, though, you'll recognize it. It's just one of those things that you have to learn by doing, by failing fast, that kind of thing. Um, if the rules are starting to get stressful, maybe at this time I can give you like a, a really easy rule. How about this one? If the in that C1, C2 situation, when the word ends in a consonant C1 and it's followed by a word with a consonant C2, if that C1 is a makara, uh, an M, it turns into the anuswara, the dot on top of the last syllable, no matter what C2 is. So pretty easy rule there to kind of like lighten things up. So if you have pustakam pathati, she reads a book, it becomes pustakam pathati, anuswara. Vanam gachami, I go to the forest. Vanam gachami, ma turns into that dot on top and it's nasalized vowel. When C1 uh, is our dental na, our nakara, now we're going to get slightly complicated again. Maybe too complicated, I apologize. Give you an easy one, right? If the C2 is a velar or label, labial classes, the ka or pa varga, the top and the bottom, nothing changes, and you write your nakara as a half n uh, to create a consonant cluster with your C2. So you get asmin grame in this village, asmin pakshe on this side. No change, but the n becomes a half consonant. If C2 is a palatal, a retroflex, or a dental, the middle three vargas, then one of two things is going to happen. Now, if it's a voiced consonant, the nakara jumps to the nasal of that same class. It assimilates to the nasal in that class. So, mahan damaraha, a big riot, would become mahan damaraha. Etan juhoti, he offers these, would become etan juhoti, when the nakara becomes the nyakara. On the other hand, if C2 is a palatal, retroflex, or dental, but is unvoiced, then weird stuff happens. Uh, the nakara now turns into an anuswara, so no problem. But there's an inserted sibilant that's going to have to match the class of the that C2 stop. So if we had gachan followed by cha, you would turn the n into an anuswara, a dot on top. But then you have to insert an s, uh, uh, sorry, a half sh, uh, uh, since that matches the palatal class of the cha. So you get gachonsh cha. Very tricky. Uh, and we're going to see this Sunday all the time because of that cha, actually, which means and. Uh, similarly, if you had tan followed by tan again, uh, the first n is going to turn into an anuswara plus the dental sibilant now s. So you have tan stan. If you have asmin followed by tika in this commentary, then we get asmustika with a retroflex sh that's added. Asmustika. So indeed, Sandhi rules. <laughs> uh, we're going to arrive at the weirdest consonant Sandhi rules of them all, in my opinion. Uh, if in your C1, C2, C2 is a lakara, 
then kind of weird things happen in two different cases. If C1 is the T kara, it's going to turn into a L kara, and you're going to get a double L. So Tat Lokaha becomes Tal Lokaha, his world, her world. But if C1 is a N kara, the dental end, strap yourselves in, N is going to not become just an Anuswara, but it's going to turn into what's called the Chandra Bindu a little crescent with a dot on top. We saw it actually in our Onkara, if you remember. Our La then also gets doubled. So we have, if we have Tan Lokan, those worlds, this is going to turn into Tang Lokan, where it's, and it's all going to be smashed together into one word. Then last but not least, maybe the oddest, the weirdest rule of them all, is what happens when our C2 is a H Gara, our aspirate. Uh, in this case, the C1 stop becomes voiced, but then the H gara turns into the corresponding voiced and aspirated member of C1's consonant class. So in the case of Vak, followed by He, the G gara would gain your voicing, become the G gara, but the H gara now is going to jump into becoming the voiced aspirate velar. Since the G is the velar, it's going to turn into the. So you get Vagdi. You'll see that, and it's going to be your job to know that it really means Vakhi. No one's going to help you. Uh, this means, of course, speech indeed. Uh, and you'll say Sandhi rules. And here's one last one to prove that Sandhi rules. Tat followed by He. The Thakara would become the, uh, and the Hakara becomes the, and you get Tadhi. That indeed. That Sandhi indeed, yes, it rules, it rules us. Uh, it's a special part of this journey into the language of the gods. It makes many people just want to get off of the train. But we've made it through the hardest bits of Sandhi, believe it or not. Uh, so you can take a break, look at all of the examples that you can find in the Goldman Primer, uh, and do some of the practice exercises that we've given for you on the ubcsanskrits.ca website. When you're feeling comfortable, relaxed, then we can come back and we'll take on our final segment where we'll look at our last Sunday topic, which is called Visarga Sandhi. So thanks for listening. Sorry to have overly burdened you with all of these Sunday rules. And see you next time. Punar milamaha, danyavadaha. <laughs>